Reader Nation, thank you for joining us on the Only Nation podcast, brought to you by the Raider Ramble and sponsored by Betway and now Signables. My name is Heidi, but you may know me as Kevlar Prom Dress or even Raider Ladybug. I'm here with T3 Raider Facts, and we're ready to talk some Raiders football together. Always ready to talk Raiders football, Heidi, and we do have a lot to discuss on this episode. Today on the show, we'll talk about the game against the Broncos on Sunday and then turn our attention to the Seattle Seahawks up in the great Northwest. Kind of near me, actually, sort of. They're a long ways away. (laughs) Yeah, that is kind of a long ways away. Raider Nation, we would love to hear from you. So here's how you can get in touch with us. Give us a call on the Only Nation podcast voicemail line at 904-701-8667. That's 904-701-8667. You can also check us out on the web at onlynationpod.com. Here's the latest Raider news. Derek Carr was 23 for 37 for 307 yards and two touchdowns, both to his buddy Devontae Adams, who caught seven balls for 141 yards and both touchdowns, including the walk-off touchdown in overtime. As the Las Vegas Raiders down the Denver Broncos 22 to 16, their sixth consecutive win against Denver. And let it be said that Denver Broncos have never, ever beaten the Las Vegas Raiders. So now they are six of their last six, and of course it couldn't have come at a better time. We'll talk about the fact that it broke the losing streak and everything else, but it was so good to see them bounce back and get a win, get a road win on top of that, and against a tough division rival whom we just don't care for very much. They're not that tough this year. I don't want to cast any stones at a glass house there. (laughs) (laughs) They do have a very, very good defense. They do. Our offense outscored their offense against the number one defense, so that's pretty good. That's an improvement. Yeah. Josh Jacobs continued to run hard and elevate this team on Sunday. He carried the ball 24 times for 109 yards and also caught three passes for 51 yards. You know, as great as Josh Jacobs has been playing, I still cringe every time he gets the ball because I know he's got an injury history. And if he goes down to injury, that's only one of two really reliable weapons that Derek has. So I continue to applaud Josh Jacobs for his hard running and the fact that he's been really consistent. And the fact that they found the ground game again uh, really bodes well, hopefully. Knock on wood. But I, I really hope that Josh can continue to stay healthy and continue to put up big numbers. I think he's going to get a big contract next year. I just don't think it's going to be with Raiders. But he or he's going to earn every penny that he gets. And he's going to deserve every penny that he gets. And for anybody who has been a, a naysayer or doubter about him over the course of this year, you know, he could have very easily uh, said, I'm just going to take my ball home and go home and not played uh, because of the fact that they didn't pick up his option. But he's done anything but that. He's been uh, the man. He has, has come out every game run hard every play. He's been dependable. He's been so far durable, but I just hope that holds up. And I think it will, but I also think the Raiders are going to offer him an extension. Uh, Whether he takes it or not is going to be up to him. But there's also the possibility of a franchise tag on him as well, isn't there? There is. I just don't think that with the money that he's going to garner on the market, I just don't think that the Raiders are going to be able to resign him. I don't think it's a it's a not want to issue. I just think it's a not going to be able to issue with all the other things they've got to address, and with a, a good young running back in Samir White already behind him. Samir White, I don't think has had positive yardage in a month. That's true. Now he was not uh, he was not suited up this past week, so he's had some injuries to battle as well. But I think he's going to be the guy they turn to going down the road. I could be wrong, but uh, uh, if if Josh Jacobs is not back next year, I think it's going to be as a result of the fact that he's just going to get a large bag of money from somewhere else. Yeah, and I don't want to make it sound like I don't have confidence in Zamir White. I think that he really is a very good young running back. And I do think he is our future. But um, it just seems that he's doomed whenever he's given the ball, he doesn't get the blocking. And I don't know why that is, but it seems to happen every time he's handed the ball. 
Well, this line is still coming together, but part of that, and again, I'll get back to the play calling. Uh, the play calling, to my mind, is still suspect, and I think Derek is still doing a lot of what Josh wants. And Josh, uh, I have to preface this by saying Josh McDaniels. I probably should not call him Josh. I think only Jacobs gets that benefit. But, uh, yeah, McDaniels' play calling, I think, has just been suspect down the line. And, and I think Derek needs to get to the point where he challenges his head coach sometimes, like – like Rich Gannon used to do with Gruden. I mean, they, they didn't always seem to eye to eye. And there were some times that Gannon checked out of a play that Gruden called, and they would they would harp and bark at each other on the sideline. But, uh, you know, Gannon made it work. And I think Derek needs to, to be able to make those changes and then come back to the sideline and defend those choices. It's pretty clear that Josh McDaniels hasn't been letting him make those changes. Uh, so I'm not sure if uh, possibly – he gave him a little bit more freedom on Sunday. I'm not really sure, but Josh McDaniels really needs to let Derek Carr uh, make some decisions. Is he an elite quarterback? No, but he's a nine-year veteran and he can see a lot of things that Josh McDaniels can't. Derek actually let it slip during the press conference. I'm not sure if many people caught it, but somebody was asking about the connections between him and Devontae. And he said, well, you know, there's other throws I need to make to other places. And that just kind of stood out to me as if to say uh, McDaniels is talking to him in his ear and saying, oh, you have to make these throws to these guys. Devontae should always be a look regardless of what play is called because he just proves that he is such an elite weapon. And on those touchdowns, uh, he just couldn't be defended. And that last play, I don't know what Denver was thinking. I think maybe they thought the receivers were somewhere out in L.A. or something, but they were nowhere near him on that touchdown. Oh, yeah. When I saw him so wide open, my eyes lit up like saucers. I was just like, I just started screaming when I saw him that wide open. And everybody had to know he was going to get the ball. Yeah. Oh, well, they played like the Raiders for once. Yes, they outraided the Raiders. Yes, they did. Denzel Perryman returned to the defensive lineup, and the defense stepped up its play and limited the Broncos to just 16 points. Perryman and Max Crosby each had five tackles on the day. Max had two sacks and also a forced fumble and a blocked attempted field goal. Yeah, Max did it all, but the return of Denzel Perryman, I think, was the energy spark that this defense needed. And I'm not sure if you noticed, but it seemed like Clee Furl was really playing with a lot more energy. And he and Denzel were teaming up on quite a few things. And I think it even got Chandler Jones energized in the game. But I think Denzel Perryman uh, is the catalyst of this defense. I mean, Max Crosby obviously brings in every play. We'll talk about him a little bit more later, but but I think the return of Perryman really helped this defense more than anything else. And it was just great to see him shoot through the line and get the tackle for loss on that one play. I mean, he that was, was awesome. Yeah. They didn't have a prayer against him. He blew that play up like Raiders of old. Yes, he did. Special teams play was better for the Raiders, but the team was still penalized nine times for 98 yards. But I think we can all agree that the penalty on Devontae Adams was understandable because the referees, once again, demonstrated their disdain for those who wear silver and black and didn't make an obvious call. And it was obvious. As soon as the flag went down, I thought, oh, well, you know, obviously, and they showed the replay. I mean, the guy obviously came in with his helmet and made helmet helmet contact. Those are going to get flagged every time. The fact that this was not called, I'm just still scratching my head. The only thing I can think is that the, the referees just have a disdain for those who uh, wear the Raiders colors. That would have been an instant call for any other team in the league, I'm convinced. Yeah, well, the announcers said something about like, oh, well, that wasn't a shot to the head. So, you know, that was a shot to the shoulder. So that's why it wasn't a penalty. But that's not what it looked like on the replay. Even so. If a player launches with the crown of his helmet first, it's a penalty. Every iteration of the rule book I can see, regardless of whether it's helmet to helmet contact, if a player launches himself helmet first and makes contact, that's targeting. Oh, um, you're just reading black and white again. I wish I was, because black and white are the color of the officials. Zebra, zebra. <laughs> and I usually like zebras, too. I've seen them in the wild. And I've also seen them on the field. Zebras are majestic animals. They are. I still have a soft spot for elephants, though. They're my spirit wild animal. But you know, they both gather at the same watering hole. They do. 
but the elephants drink more and I'm a big drinker. <laughs> there you go. I've actually seen elephants spray the zebras before. Oh, that's nice. On hot days, give them a little shower. A little interplay there. A little animal interplay. Yeah. Last week, the Raiders claimed defensive tackle Jerry Tillery off waivers from the Los Angeles Chargers. The former 2019 first-round pick played in 54 games with 29 starts in his four-year stay in Los Angeles. He saw some game action with the Raiders against the Broncos and made a tackle. Also playing for the Raiders was cornerback Tyler Hall, having been activated from the practice squad. After being recently added to the team after spending time with both the Rams and Falcons in 2020 and 2021, Hall had a sack against the Broncos. The other player added to the roster was tight end Jacob Hollister, who was claimed off the Minnesota Vikings practice squad. Defensive tackle Kyle Pico was reverted back to the practice squad. Again, lots of changes going on in the middle of the season. I think the pickup of Jerry Tillery is going to be a big pickup for the Raiders down the road. Right now, he's just a depth piece. But if that's somebody that we can come back and get to perform consistently, that could be a really good addition for this defensive line. They've been kind of scratching and clawing to find pieces, but you know that might be a replacement for Cleef Earl, or it might be a replacement for somebody else. They already jettisoned Jonathan Hankins earlier in the year, and as you recall, I didn't think that he was going to make the squad last year because of age catching up with him and everything, but they were able to convert that and get a draft pick. Now, we'll see what happens with the draft coming up, but I hope that Tillery becomes a part of that nucleus. Uh, It's going to be a a young team, but he's got to have some veteran presence, and he could be a good addition for that. Tyler Hall, I didn't even know he was on the team. When he made the sacks, like, wait a minute, who is that? And and then I had to go back and search and see that he had been elevated from the practice squad after recently being added. Once again, Jacob Hollister could be a nice addition here and there. Uh, He's obviously not going to replace Foster Perot, and he cannot replace Darren Waller. But uh, again, another tight end. We're starting to collect tight ends again, it looks like. I'm actually mildly excited about the Tillery addition, and I think that he could make a really good piece of the defensive unit in the future. And even today, I think he could be a valuable depth piece. But in the future, I think he could be a really valuable part. And that addition of Tyler Hall came out of nowhere. And just like his sack, that was a pretty, pretty sack. I was really happy to see that. Raiders had three sacks on the day. That was very unusual and I think made a big difference in the game. I saw the sack. I saw the numeral three. and I thought, oh, it was Roger Teamer. And I thought, wait a minute, 37. (laughs) Who is that? Where would that number come from? KT3, what did you see as you watched the game against Denver? Okay, here's what I saw. In the first half, the Raiders possessed the ball three times. In my opinion, Josh McDaniels blew it on the first drive. They got all the way down into Denver territory. Mac Collins had the penalty to push the Raiders back to the Denver 42, and then they had an incomplete pass. They were in range for Daniel Carlson to kick a field goal. And, of course, he's demonstrated that he is very capable of 50-plus yard field goals. And plus, in the light Denver air, you know, why not try to cap off the first drive and get some points on the road when your team desperately needs it? I think that was a blown play call on his behalf. Punting, I know they've tried to punt deep and get Denver pinned back into their own territory, but when you're on the road and you're trying to break a losing streak, you want to finish with points on your first drive, and they didn't do that. I think that's all on McDaniels once again. Now, on the second drive, uh, they got down to the Denver 27, then they had a holding penalty and a sack and incompletion, and then Daniel Carlson missed a field goal. Of course, they were the announcers were talking up the fact that he had this streak going on, and you just knew that the more they talked about it, that eventually Carlson was going to miss, and he did. Then on the third drive, there was a touchdown to Devontae. So they only had the seven points, but they very easily could have had 13 you know, if not more in the first half. Second half, they just they were just inconsistent. They had to settle for a long field goal in the first drive coming out of the second half. And then they went six plays in a punt, then three plays in a punt, and then ten plays and only gained twenty six yards. I mean, how do you do that? 
you run a 10 play drive, you only pick up 26 yards, and your field goal kicker has to settle for a 57 yard field goal. Uh, again, this offense just has to step up and has been doing it consistently. Then they had three plays in a punt. They finally had that ninth drive, the last one with regulation, where they went seven plays and 71 yards. And, and Derek did that without any timeouts. He got the team all the way down to and got him a field goal. And then, of course, there was that touchdown drive in overtime where you had the big pass and catch to Foster Morrow. And then, of course, you had the one to Devontae. But again, not enough consistency and horrible play calling, in my opinion. It was a lot up and down. And as far as Daniel Carlson goes, he's only human. <laughs> he, had, he had kicked 41 straight field goals. So it was about time for him to miss one. I, I mean, the league record is 44 from Adam Vinatieri, who, in my opinion, should be a Hall of Famer. And he will be. But yeah, 41 straight field goals is it's perfection. <laughs> And at some point, he's going to miss. But I, I was disappointed on that first drive to see them roll over and die, really. That's what it looked like to me. I would honestly say if Daniel Carlson is within 60 yards, let him try, especially in Denver. You know, m maybe not, you know, 65 yards unless it's at the end of the half. But... uh <laughs> If he's within 60 yards in Denver, let him have a shot. Absolutely. And, you know, McDaniels knows that because he used to coach in Denver. And you would think if anybody had any confidence in a kicker at all, he would have confidence in Carlson. I just don't understand it. I, I don't understand him. And I want to, I really do want to give him every benefit of the doubt because, of course, having gotten that vote of confidence from, from the owner, uh, from Mark Davis, you understand that, that he's going to be there uh, for the rest of this year and probably next year too, unless something horribly, horribly goes wrong. But I just think that at the very least, Mark needs to take the play calling duties away from him and say, look, you can coach the team. Let's just focus on that. The play calling is just, it just needs, something needs to happen. Something needs to change. Yeah. I mean, look at the last half of last year. Derek was out there calling almost all the plays and look what they did. They made it to the playoffs. You know, like I said, not an elite quarterback, but he's been there nine years. He knows what he's seeing. Let him make those calls. And the first couple of weeks after the whole uh, Gruden and then uh, Henry Ruggs thing, when they played back-to-back -back games, Derek looked as comfortable as I've ever seen him in an offense in, in games against Denver and Philadelphia back-to-back. -back. He looked comfortable. He looked like he was able to make the reads. And the team, I think, believed in him to be able to do that. I don't think the team believes right now simply because they don't believe in Josh McDaniel's play calling. I don't think it's they don't have – confidence in Derek. I think it's that they just don't believe in the in the process. And of course, at the beginning of the year, uh, we had all these signs and all these little blurbs about the fact that Josh McDaniels is not just teaching them the process. He's teaching them the why, you know, why we do this, why we need to do this. Well, my big question is, why are we doing this? As a Raiders fan, I don't ever want to hear the word process again. Unless it's like a food processor, right? Food processors are great, especially around Christmas when it's time for tamales. Yeah, there you go. Maybe we should just throw McDaniels in a food processor. Then. <laughs> that works for me. All right. What do you think is going to happen this coming week against Seattle? All right. Well, the Raiders finally got a road win last week, and they also broke a losing streak. Now, Seattle's always been a tough place to play, but I think the rediscovery of the running game and the more stable play of Derek Carr, I said more stable, bodes well for this team. Now, if they can cut down on penalties, and if Carr can be more consistently accurate, I think both Devontae and Josh can have big enough games to push the Raiders to another victory. Yes, you heard it from me first. I don't know how they're going to pull it off, but I'm calling for a win this week. The next three opponents for the Seahawks are the 3-7 and seven Raiders, followed by the 3-7 and seven Rams, and then the 3-8 and eight Panthers. So I think that this game is going to catch them napping coming out of their bye week. All the tea leaves read that Seattle should win this game, but I'm calling for a 28-27 upset win on Sunday. Okay, and I don't want to jinx the Raiders, so I'm going to call for a loss. Okay. Because we both called for a loss against Denver, and... It worked. So I'm going to call for a loss because 
that double mojo paid off, did Exactly. And all I can say is, who thought Geno Smith would be one of the top-rated passers this year? It's amazing. Geno Smith actually leads the NFL with a 72.8 completion percentage, and he ranks in the top six in touchdown passes and passer rating. He's even emerged as a dark horse candidate for the MVP. He changed from a seven-year backup who even once was famously punched in the jaw by one of his teammates in the Jets locker room. He's become a leader of that offense, and and Seattle's really going to have to make a decision as soon as the season ends uh, about what to do with him. Well, I hope he learned to pay back teammates when he borrows money. That's true. That probably will help help save him physically in many ways. Yes. Angrio was saying, you know, what's the irony of this that we're playing Russell Wilson and we've got a real shot. And next week against Geno Smith, nobody expects us to win. <laughs> Who would have called that at the beginning of the year? At the beginning of the year, I was looking at that Seattle game and just licking my chops because I, like many people, thought that Seattle might end up with probably the worst team in the league. But no, we have to. I definitely don't think we're the worst team in the league. Uh, We might have played like it for a few weeks, but definitely not the worst team in the league. The amount of talent on the roster prevents that from being so. See, I think you hit the nail on the head right there. I don't think it's the Raiders are the worst team in the league. It's just at points they play like the worst team in the league. Yeah. Okay, Tree 3, why don't you tell us your top three for the week? T3's Top 3. Okay, here is this week's version of T3's Top 3. Number one, Colton Miller was a big missing piece on that offensive line versus Denver, and yet the patchwork line was able to limit the Broncos to just one sack, and the Raiders had no turnovers. Now, if Miller can return and rejuvenate a group that's playing a little better, then I think that offense can continue to open up. Number two, the Raiders actually did their next opponent, the Seahawks, a favor this past week. By beating the Broncos, Denver now elevates itself to the number five overall pick in next year's draft. But that pick will end up going to Seattle because that's what Denver gave up in order to get Russell Wilson. And number three, people within Raider Nation, especially on social media, were griping about the fact that the win against Denver cost this team draft positioning toward potentially picking up a first-round franchise quarterback in the 2023 draft. But in my opinion, this team is more than just a promising young quarterback away and that the build should continue on defense. And that is this week's top three. I will never accept being okay with losing. I don't care how bad the record is. I don't care how badly we need the number one draft pick. Besides, the Raiders have shown and first round draft picks don't work very well. I agree with you totally. But I will never accept being unhappy with a win. That's just wrong. That's not being a Raider. I'm not a tank mode fan. Yeah, absolutely not. And I definitely don't think the Raiders are trying to tank, especially after that game against the Broncos. I agree. Colton Miller, he's always just such a valuable leader to the line. And when I heard that he was not going to be playing, I was a little bit worried, I'll be honest. But the line did come together and they pulled it off. So hopefully he'll be able to return soon. But um Yeah, when I saw him on the inactive list, my mouth dropped a little bit. And the Raiders doing the Seahawks a favor. You're welcome. (laughs) Couldn't happen to a nicer franchise. All right, give us a call at 904-701-8667. Leave a voicemail or text message at that number or send in a message via social media and we'll share your thoughts. And on Raider Roots this week... All right, should be coming out this week. We're going to go back and revisit the year 2010. This is the first time that the Raiders break back into uh, not having a losing season in seven years. And included in that is going to be a big, epic 59-14 victory over our friends in Denver. Well, this week or next. No, okay, got it. KT3, let's find out what we do or we don't know. All right. 
It's time for another edition of Did You Know? In this segment, I will ask Heidi and all of our listening audience a Raiders-related question with a list of answers to choose from. It's multiple choice, so give it your best guess. Here's this week's question. In 1971, linebacker Phil Villapiano was selected in the second round of the NFL draft. The Raiders drafted 17 players that year, including Horace Jones, tight end Bob Moore, and legendary Sea of Hands hero Clarence Davis, who was also one of the heroes in Super Bowl XI. Here's this week's question. Who was the Raiders' first round selection in 1971? Was it A, Jim Plunkett? Was it B, Jack Tatum? Or was it C, Raymond Chester? Well, I know it wasn't Jim Plunkett. He came to the Raiders via the Patriots. Correct. He was the number one overall pick that year, though. Yes, but the Raiders did not select him in the first round. You're correct. So that leaves a toss-up between Jack Tatum and Raymond Chester. I'm going to go with C, Raymond Chester. Raymond Chester was drafted in the first round in 1970. And Jack Tatum was the first round pick in 1971 out of Ohio, out of the Ohio State University. There goes my streak. There goes your streak. I didn't think you'd be that tricky. Well, I was hoping that, and maybe thinking that you could have remembered that uh, Raymond Chester actually uh, was a vital part of the offense in the in 1970 in that uh, AFC title game against the. Baltimore Colts. That was six years before I was born. No, I don't remember it. Actually, it wasn't the AFC title game. It was a divisional game. So, No, it was the title game. That's right. I, was, I should have stuck to my guns and stuck, stuck with that. Yes. It was the AFC title game. Yeah. Well, I just remembered that I thought Chester was a first round draft pick. So that was kind of, kind of why I went with him. I wasn't too far off. No, you weren't. You weren't. If you narrowed it down to those two, I could see where you would do it either way if you didn't truly know Raiders history. And you know for the most part, but again, I got to slide some in here, here and there. Very funny. Oh, well. We'll start a new winning streak next week. Yeah, so you won't try to trick me as much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for Heidi's Heroes. All right, Raider Nation, this week is pretty simple. Raiders defense was elevated compared to where they normally are on Sunday against the Broncos. The Raiders defense definitely made a huge contribution to the win. Now, it's not to say that they did a great job, but for them, they did really good. And while Denzel Perriman might be the spark plug that the Raiders need on defense. Max Crosby is the leader of the defense. And Max Crosby had an incredible game. Uh, He is Heidi's hero for this week. He had six total tackles, one of them being an assist, two sacks, one forced fumble. And at the end of the half, when the Raiders most needed it, he blocked a field goal attempt. Now, if it wasn't for that blocked field goal attempt, the Raiders would have never made it to overtime. He was an integral part of the game. And while there were definitely a few performances that deserve honorable mention, one of them being Devontae Adams, seven catches for 141 yards and two touchdowns, that's hard to top. I think that Max is the actual hero So, Max Crosby, you are Heidi's hero for this week. And that's a really, really good choice. And I do want to preface your comments by saying that a lot of times when athletes get that big bag of money, you see their production either go down or you don't see that motor run like it did when they're either in a contract year or really trying to get that money. Max goes hard all the time. That's just the way he is. It goes all the way back to that first training camp when he was just trying to make the team and he broke his hand and he said, no, no, I don't want to miss any time. Just wrap it up and I'll continue to play. Uh, he has shown that. He has been consistent in nothing else in terms of his productivity, in terms of his energy. He's such a great teammate. He is great to the fans. I mean, what more could you want? He is the poster boy, uh, really, for this Raiders franchise. He is the face of this franchise, in my opinion. 
Uh, you can say it's other players. Uh, you can say it's Devontae with his star quality and, of course, being one of the best receivers in the league. But I think when you talk about really leaders of this team, you have to look at number 98. He is definitely, like I said, Denzel Perryman, spark plug of the defense, but Max Crosby, overall leader, and it really made a difference in that game. If it wouldn't have been for Max Crosby, the Raiders would not have come out on top. I totally agree. And that about does it for this week on the Only Nation podcast. If you'd like to help support the show, you can send in a donation at paypal.me slash onlynationpod. You can find me, Heidi Stabbert, on social media as at Kevlar Prom Dress on Twitter and Instagram or Heidi Stabbert on Facebook. You can also find me on YouTube on Captain Jack Rackham's channel every other Tuesday night. I join the DC wench Peggy Holmes in Angry Trask on Silver and Black Ladies Night. And as I want to wish all of our listeners a happy Thanksgiving coming up this week, I want to encourage all of you. At Raider Nation, as our podcast continues to grow, we really do want you to be on board with us. So please contact the show. Send us your name and address so we can send you some free Raider swag and podcast stickers. Call us and tell us what you want to know. Throw us an interesting nugget that we can use on one of our upcoming episodes. And and we really do want you to become a part of what we're doing here. Remember, this is the only nation. And we want you to be a part of it. So call us at 904-701-8667. That's 904-701-8667. Call us now and join the Only Nation podcast family. There are two easy ways to find me on social media. You can send me a tweet at T3 underscore sports 703. Or you can hit me up on Facebook at Tom T-H-O-M Jones. I want to also thank all of you for continued support of the Raider Roots Project. As we mentioned, this this week we'll be going back to the year 2010, and the Raiders finally break it even in 8-8 eight eight after suffering many losing seasons in a row. So uh, hope is there, just like hope is available for us. So please give me your feedback on the episodes. Tell me what you want to know more about, and we'll look forward to joining you again shortly. As always, we look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, everyone. Go Raiders. And once again, happy Thanksgiving to you and everyone out there. Uh, Love on your family. Be safe. Do all the things that, that you need to do. And also stay faithful and stay loyal to us. Because remember, we are not just a nation. We are the only nation. Raiders.